I'm certain as a practitioner, you've talked about stress with your clients before. And yes, everyone is experiencing stress of all sorts, right, these days, whether it has to do with finances or relationships or a chronic health journey that someone is under, or uh, even the fact that we're, you know, in more of a political news cycle. I mean, all these things can be major stressors for people. And um, I think it's one thing to say, please do some stress reduction techniques to clients. And another thing to really provide some interesting information about how stress that they can control really truly can impact the health of their mitochondria and even increase things like the um, antioxidant glutathione in the body. So what am I referring to here? Well, there is a researcher named Martin Picard. And Martin Picard, Dr. Martin Picard has studied extensively the effect of psychological stress on mitochondrial efficiency, mitochondrial energy production. He's created things like the mitochondrial health index, for example, and even came up with the term mitochondrial allostatic load to talk about the threshold with which mitochondria stop becoming really efficient energy producers and start to get negatively impa impacted by psychological stress. Very interesting study that he did actually showed that when someone went to bed, either went to bed angry or in fear or in frustration or woke up, angry, fear, frustration, the ability of their mitochondria to generate adequate energy for their cells decreased by 12 to 15, up to 20%. And so this is something I think that we could, it could really explain to your clients, like, no, this sta the state at which you go to bed, the psychological state with which you go to bed, and the psychological state with which you wake up really can actually um, either help or impair your mitochondria's ability to make that important energy for you which I define as adequate ATP and water inside of the cells. And so this would then give us tools that we could recommend to our clients. This is why I ask my clients to have a morning practice when they go outside at sunrise of things like gratitude. Um, a gratitude practice, while yes, yes, it sounds, it, it sounds nice, but I don't have the time. I hear clients like, I don't have the time to take out my journal and write three things that I was grateful for. But certainly if we stack a gratitude practice with something that the client is already likely doing, for example, getting that early morning light exposure, it allows them to um, apply something more consistently. And so that I, so I oftentimes have my clients stack a few things together during what I call their sunrise eyes or their morning light practice. The first one would be obviously getting the light into their eyes, but also the gratitude is not just, oh, me feeling good to start my day. I actually tell them this practice right here is going to support your mitochondria for that day. Conversely, on the other on the other side of the, the coin in terms of going to bed at night, I want my clients to have a nighttime wind down routine that doesn't involve scrolling on social media or watching stressful TV shows or, or news or things like that. I want them to have a practice where they, of course, block the artificial light at night, which I think is very important to signal nighttime at all. But also then they've got a practice with which they can um bring their body back into a state potentially of gratitude or joy. Some clients I even say, hey, watch something that makes you laugh before bedtime or watch something that brings you joy or read something that brings you joy. Or, you know, what I oftentimes like to do before going to bed is a, a loving kindness meditation, a meta meditation, which is very easy to teach clients to do um, and not very hard to memorize once you get you know, a few sentences down. And so, um, so yeah, these are things that I think are important to, to yes, tell clients. And, and sometimes we're like, yeah, yeah, I'm too busy to do that. So the idea of stacking it with something they already do in conjunction with, I think, some very interesting research to say this alone will support your mitochondrial energy production by 12, 15, 20 percent. There is another interesting study. Now, this is an exploratory study, um, and this is kind of that, I, you know, in terms of how does intention or mood or words, uh, emotions affect our mitochondria. And this was an exploratory study uh, that was done in 2022 that involved cell tissue cultures. So we're talking about cell cultures. I believe that these were kidney cells. And what they did, and this was a group of Chinese researchers who were using two Chinese symbols one of them that represented um, the emotion, kind of like the uh, positive emotions such as love, compassion, respect, joy, good health, and positive energy. And then another group of those symbol, uh, the Chinese characters, were words that included things like hatred, atrocity, selfishness, resentment, resentment, sadness, disease, and negative energy. 
So they measured things like cell. So basically what they did was they exposed these cell cultures in a blinded fashion. The research teams themselves didn't know what words they were exposing. These were these were covered in blinded and just the, the, these, the Chinese characters themselves with these different meanings, these opposite meanings essentially, were shown to these cell cultures. And then they measured the different parameters um, of essentially cell health or cell growth. And what they found was specifically, um, what, what they specifically found that I found very fascinating was that when the cells were given the words that had more positive and loving connotations, they found improvements in mitochondrial energy production and specifically mitochondrial membrane potential, which is what the mitochondria needs to build up. They need to build up that proton gradient in the inner membrane space to drive both water and ATP production. So that's beautiful. They also measured um, things like free radical production and the antioxidant glutathione. And they found that um, when exposed to those words that had a positive association, the cell cultures not only generated more ATP and had better mitochondrial membrane potential, but then also increased its own endogenous production of glutathione to help clear up any cellular damage. Uh, and the increase, I believe, in mitochondrial ATP production was about 20, per, they, the both of them were about 20%, 21, 22% in there. So again, that's a significant increase. So perhaps then this will help our clients to, to choose their media appropriately, choose their words or their thoughts appropriately. Because if these cell tissue card cultures are simply responsive to cards that have different words on them, and these words obviously have different energetic patterns, and we can either promote health through one set of words or dis-ease or maybe just lack of health or lack of healing through another set of words, again, it's studies like this that I love to highlight to my clients because it helps empower them with the choices they make throughout the day. Again, choosing to stay away from that co uh, coworker that perhaps gossips and is negative all the time, choosing to read things that bring joy or, um, you know, compassion or love into their life, positive stories, positive things. And so I hope this as a clinician just gives you a couple of key studies through the lens of how our intention, how our words, and how our psychological stress can impact our mitochondria and their ability to produce the energy we need both to accomplish our everyday tasks, let alone the energy that it requires to truly heal from a chronic heal healing uh, during a chronic healing journey.